I'm freaking out. <laughs> In case you missed that, I'm freaking out. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Is everyone hungover or are we good? Okay. So I'm going to do a talk today called it's, It Takes a Village. <clears throat> I wrote it this week, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to have to refer to some of my speaker notes here only because I'm <clears throat> an extreme introvert and this is very difficult for me. So shout out to all my introverts in the audience who can do this. <clears throat> so I'll spend 30 seconds telling you about me. Um, I'm currently the director of security engineering at Trust, building out my own security practice at a company that focuses on software infrastructure and security, formerly with the US government. Don't boo me. Um, I didn't do what's wrong now. Um, <clears throat> but I worked for NASA securing instrument and ground systems. And then I worked for a digital delivery services organization within the federal space, um, building out infrastructure in AWS at 18F. So my background's in these things, incident response, pen testing, malware analysis. We can go through the thing, but I do security things. Um, so I'll tell you, bats are amazing, and my handle's bat. That doesn't mean I think I'm amazing. I just really like bats, the animal, not the weapon. Uh, comic books are boss, so I'm gonna hit Ghent up tomorrow and find all the comic book shops. And I did come for all your chocolates, so if you know the good place, hit me up after and let me know where to find those. <clears throat> so, the title of the talk comes from this quote. It's an African proverb. It takes a village to raise a child. <clears throat> the idea is that a community has to come together to bring up the younger folks within the village. That's kind of where it comes from. We in security have our own village. And I don't know about you, but I'd like to retire someday. So it's up to us to make sure newcomers like learn what they need to do so that we can pass the torch at some point. There's also this saying that the best way to get promoted is to hire and train your replacement. So you can keep that in mind. And you can argue with me about it later if you want to. <clears throat> okay, so it's very hard to wake up on Saturday or Friday mornings after the party last night, I guess. So I added a game to my keynote. I don't know, we'll see what happens. But basically every one of my section headers has some song lyrics, and I'll give you like five seconds to raise your hand if you know where the song came from. Please participate, because this is really hard for me, and I need you like to be involved. Um, it'll help me help you. So we'll do like a quick instructional. Sun is up, I'm a mess, who knows? Anyone? Oh no, see this might not translate well because US music, and well, we'll see. Uh, Chandelier by Sia. 2014, right? Do you feel me on this? No, no. Okay, so what you'll have at the end of this also is a ridiculous incoherent playlist that you can download to your iPods later. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk about the talent pipeline. Work's been sent our way that could last a lifetime. Anyone? Oh no, I thought you liked music. All right, Pipeline by Depeche Mode, 1983. It's a really good song. You should download it. <clears throat> All right, so jobs. We'll start with, with the pipeline, and this is kind of where we're going with the, with the morning here. Um, I pulled an article from Forbes that talked about this security pipeline. 2021, three and a half million unfilled cybersecurity positions. So what do you think that means for those of us working in security? Over time. Job security, yeah, I like the glasses half full attitude. Um, <clears throat> burnout's coming. If if your if your team needs three people and you're the only person, like stuff's still broken, the work still has to be done. Who's gonna do it? I mean, unless you're like a sociopath, you're probably gonna do the work, right? Um, and everyone gets a shell, so you get. You, Hopefully you just feel me on that one. If you're down three people on your blue team, somebody's probably getting a shell. Um, and I added this little bit about relying on technology to solve a people problem. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about AI, but HR is trying to solve the problem, right, with tech. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about why that's not working so well in just a little while. Recruiting. Come on, what you're looking for has been here the whole time. What? Meatloaf, no, no, no. If there's like a thing, I would say drink. Um, 
you belong with me, Taylor Swift. Don't you love Taylor Swift in Belgium? No, I don't love her so much either, but this is a great song. Um, all right. So the challenges with recruiting, and I'm going to give you this with the caveat. I don't know the answer to a lot of these problems, but I think it's important that we frame out the challenges so that we can we can start to tackle them. It's it's like the engineering part of my brain. Like, what problem are we trying to solve? Do we get user stories? Oh God, it's turning into a Kanban board. I mean, I can like digress all day, but um, there are a lot of challenges, and so. Let's talk about some of them. Budgets. I can't fix your budgets. Sorry. And who in here, I guess, raise your hand if you think that your company has an ample budget for security. One, two, three, four, five. Great. Okay. Raise your hand if you're screwed. I mean, it's just kind of the nature of it, right? Budgets are budgets, and, and some of this is like a cultural piece, right? That, that companies are still investing in sales and selling the thing, but not realizing that we need to do sort of a <clears throat> balanced approach to security hiring as well. Um, so company reputation. This is a challenge in hiring. If your CTO has a reputation for being abusive, um, we all talk to each other. We know people aren't going to apply at your company. It's, it's just kind of a thing. Um, the hunting grounds. So with this, I'm thinking a lot of companies tend to seek out those. Uh, in the US, it's called like the Big Ten schools, right? The Ivy League schools, the best universities, or the best corporations. Um, they're, they're searching for talent in these places that, that um, they think have the top talent, right? Because for whatever reason, these, these schools are ranked really high. And it's not that that's not a valid way to do things, but um, there are a lot of places that we can search for talent other than these normal go-to big companies, big universities. Uh, distributed teams have become a challenge in our space. You know, five years ago, maybe, I don't know, we, we debated this a little bit yesterday, but definitely 10 years ago, you didn't see security folks come up and say, I want to be remote as a job requirement, right? Or I don't want to travel a lot, or I don't want to work in an office. Um, I mean, <clears throat> we SSH into everything anyway, for the most part, right? There is, I'm not dismissing the need for, for butts and seats, we'll say. But for the most part, we've got a, a larger community entering the workforce that expect to be able to work distributed, or at least have the option to. That's a challenge for companies that are still culturally living in a space where managers want butts and seats, right? Leaders just want good talent. So, you know, we have to think about that mind shift. <clears throat> and then job descriptions in the 10-6 in the ratio. So, <clears throat> so there was a study out of HP, and then Forbes took it a step farther, and then uh, you know another polling organization took it even farther. And I've put some references for you in, in my slide deck for the takeaway. But, but essentially what it says is when you write out your job descriptions, men, and this is grossly gendered, and I'm sorry, but this is what we're going to do right now. So men tend to apply for jobs if they meet about 60% of the requirements on a job description. That's reasonable, right? What we tend to see is women and minorities applying for jobs only if they meet like 95% to 100% of the job requirements. So if you think about the way that you're writing your job descriptions, we all want that like black unicorn, right? The person who can come in and, and Java and Pearl and Ruby and, but do you really need that? Like, or do you just need one person who can write tools in one language, right? So we have to think about the, the way we're doing that. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about unconscious bias and just get it over with. I think there's a fault in my code. Anyone? Halsey, yay. Your prize is that you get to know that you're smarter than everyone else in the room right now, but only for like the next 30 seconds. Uh, so that's Gasoline by Halsey. It's a really good song if you don't know. It's, it's good. All right. So unconscious bias. I'm not going to read these things to you. You know this stuff exists. It just does. Um, 
I will admit that in the U.S. we may face different types of bias than you face here in Europe. And so I'm not going to speak to those because I don't know. I don't live here and I don't know what you're facing day to day. But I can tell you that I've never been anywhere that these things didn't all exist in some um, form. So <clears throat> I'm going to say the first four just suck. Try really hard not to do that. I don't know what else to say. Um, for stereotypes, that's a subtle one. And I'm going to tell you a story about one of my friends because it just seems like a good way to kind of talk about stereotypes. She became the first female red teamer at her security firm. And we were all so excited for her. And she's like jamming it out, writing tools, popping shells. Like she has a mentor. Everything's going great. <clears throat> Until her team sort of has a social breakdown. I don't know if I have a lot of pen testers in the room or folks who work with pen testers. I mean, we can be kind of hard to work with sometimes, right? I was just, just going to put that out there. Um, so her manager's solution was to pull her out of her pen test role, where she was very happy, and ask her to be the project manager that handled the red team for three months um, until they were able to, to bring in another project manager. Um, so what's, what's this done to her, right? The work that she enjoyed doing, she's not doing now. This other burden has been placed on her shoulders, and we'll call it emotional labor, that all of a sudden, because she was the woman on the team and because she was friendly and she got along with everyone, they thought, oh, well, we'll just move her out of the role that she's doing that's very technical, that she's very comfortable in, and we'll move her into this place where she's solving what is ultimately a, a team and human resources problem. And that's not what she signed up for, and that's not what she's getting paid to do. And that's like a subtle stereotype, right? That she could fix it because she's a woman, and, and she can get all these guys to be nice because they're mean to each other, but they won't be mean to her. And shitty for her, right? Because now all the things she was excited about doing are put on hold. And her career is essentially put on hold until they decide to bring in a PM. And what if that person can't solve the problem, right? So um, tribalism. Tribalism's a little different in the way that it manifests in our culture. Um, and this is going to seem like such a weird question to ask, right? But can all my introverts raise their hands? <laughs> Good answer. <clears throat> so this is the thing. <clears throat> introverts don't I know for myself, speaking for myself through my own filter, I, I don't mean to be tribalist. I just tend to flock toward the people that I already know and that I'm already comfortable being around and comfortable talking to. But how do you think that the, the junior or the intern in the room who really just wanted to ask me a question feels when they see me kind of flock to my people? Like, do you think they're going to come up and, and interrupt me or try to talk to me? What if they're an introvert too? So there's a breakdown in communication. And, and so tribalism, not to be confused with being an introvert, but just be aware that sometimes it can feel that way to your spectators. Let's talk about <clears throat> networking and some of the challenges in our pipeline and things that we can look at. Oh, I get by with a little help from my friends. If you don't know this, I'm just quitting. I'm not stopping until somebody answers. Beatles, thank you, finally. So is that what it is? I needed to pull in a European? OK. So 1968. <clears throat> All right, so network. I've titled this slide, Homie, Don't You Know Me, right? Like, how many people have gotten a job because somebody referred them? or because they knew somebody that already worked at the place. And you don't have to know them personally, right? Maybe you met them on Twitter. Maybe you met them on LinkedIn. I don't know. Maybe you met them through your best friend's girlfriend. Like, who knows? But networking's a big deal. Um, it builds trust. So if two people come in off the street to apply for a job, and I have one open spot, I'm probably going to give the interview to the person that has 
has been referred by a colleague that I know and respect who may have even worked with the person in the past. And that's just the way it is. Um, again, not sure how things work here, but in the United States, we have this thing called USA Jobs, and it's our portal for federal work. Um, if you just cold apply into USA Jobs, your application can sit there for years without anyone looking at it. And so people think it's very, very hard to get a government job. But if your friend is already a Fed or a federal employee and hands your resume to their boss, like you're in, the, the part about applying through USA Jobs happens at the end when they're ready to hire you and they just need to capture your information and right cross the T's, dot the I's. Um, <clears throat> referral bonuses fall into networking. Why do you think that is? Does anyone's company here have referral bonuses? Do you know what these are, right? You, you bring your friend over, they get the job, they get a job. You get a bonus. It's win-win, right? But what if you come in and you suck, and you're like the worst, and your friend referred you? Like, what does that do to their reputation? <laughs> right, no bueno. So if you can find a way to network and make friends or acquaintances, business contacts, whatever, it's a win-win for them if they can refer you for a job, right? Everyone. Everyone kind of understand what I'm saying there? So I'm speaking a little bit to the hiring managers in the room right now. If your company doesn't offer a referral bonus program, you're probably missing out on some talent that you didn't even know was available, right? Um, when your friends are out of work and looking, you're the first ones to know, right? Like, what do you have? So keep that kind of that kind of thing in mind as a, as a good networking tool. Um, social media, <clears throat> this is our world. I'm not on Facebook, really, but uh, LinkedIn, I am endorsed for cheese and sweaters. My LinkedIn is not serious, OK? Like, it's ridiculous. I'm also endorsed for wizardry. Um, but in most companies, LinkedIn is kind of the first place your employer will check to see uh, where you've worked before. It's a bonus if people have already written little recommendations for you in those fields in LinkedIn. It kind of lets them know that, oh, you actually aren't lying and you did have a job at that place. Twitter, Twitter is a great place for like information security professionals to, to collaborate, to talk to each other, to fight, to post memes, to be awful. You know, like you get it, we, we digress. Sucks. But Twitter is a good place to like meet other security professionals. So think about those those things as you're building out your online presence, and it and it sucks. And and if you're a security person with no social media, cool. But what I'm saying is that a potential employer is gonna try to look you up. They're gonna do recon before they bring you in. Like it's just a thing. So for better or for worse, like be ready to stand by whatever like awful meme you posted on Twitter, right? Because your potential boss may see it. <clears throat> I've posted some terrible ones, and I just got that out in the open at my interview. So start networking today. I added this bit last night because Stephanie up in registration has the, the mentee mentor stickers that you can wear. And there was a little event yesterday where folks were, were networking and, and talking to one another. And, and she's got a stack left. So um, if you want to start networking, you can do that today. Go grab a mentor or a mentee sticker, or you can think of it as a hiring looking sticker, but it's a good way to, to find your counterpart and just have a, a conversation with each other. Um, so registration. CNBC, I don't exist when you don't see me. Where are my goths at? Nowhere in this damn room. Okay, so that's Sisters of Mercy, uh, 1990 really good. You should check them out. I don't know what's wrong with you all. Okay. All right. So I'll break it up just a little bit. I don't do this too often in this talk today, but <clears throat> I have some tips for employers and then I'll have some tips for people who are looking. Um, so focus on your brand. So for my employers and folks representing their companies in this room, Branding has always been kind of a marketing term, right? We think of it in terms of logo and, you know, websites and, you know, we're, we're moving past that for branding now. When I talk about branding, I'm talking about your company's culture, your company's values. Are they listed on your website? It, it sounds very soft skillish, 
but I can tell you that underrepresented groups in technology are checking your website and, and they are looking for some sort of statement of company values, some sort of statement about culture, um, even some statement about families, benefits. Um, <clears throat> the employees are doing recon on your companies as well, so just be aware of that. Your job descriptions. You probably need to go back and, like half of you should go back and rewrite half your job descriptions. There are some little things that you can do in your job descriptions to attract more talent. Like, it's just proven. There's languages. There's I have phrasing. Um, there are even tools out there if you're, you know, a tech nerd like I am that'll help you. There's a tool called Textio, and it'll scan your job description for little flags that may make your, your description of the position seem biased. So here's an example. Did you know that if you put sports references in your job description, consciously or unconsciously, it kind of turns people who aren't into sports off. So if you are like, we're going to knock it out of the park or a par for the course, like, if you're not really into sports, you're just like, well, what kind of culture is this? I don't want to go and, and talk about sports all day. It, it's just a thing. Um, with the phrasing bit, there are some mistakes that you're making in job descriptions because you want to find the person who knows everything about everything, and don't we all? I do. So let's say you have an open position and you list that you are looking for someone who knows, well, how do you put it? You'll put proficient in Python, Java, Ruby, and Swift. Do you really need that from one person? Do you really mean that? Do you want somebody who's like okay at all four or do you want somebody who's really good at one? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, you can build the tool in any language you want as long as the tool works. Like, I don't care what language you write it in. So maybe you just, a simple word change from and to or would open up the pool of applicants that then feel like they should apply to the position. And this goes back to that 10-6 ratio, right? If I see that you want all four of these languages and you have the and, like, I'm not qualified for that role. But maybe I was. Maybe that was just your laundry list looking for, like, your magical security fairy who could come and do all these magical things. Those folks are rare. And then taking chances. So that's, that's part of it, right? Like, what if you switch to or? What if you interview someone who only wants to, to code in one language? What if you think outside that box of this strict formula that you've had for the last 10 years in hiring and realize that the landscape's changed and you've got to change with it or you're not going to attract good talent? <clears throat> so for my job seekers in the room, I won't make you raise your hand, but you could get one of those stickers and find each other. Um, do your research. So this is the recon piece that I was talking about. You know. Um, I'm not dismissing that, that we all reach points of desperation where we find ourselves unemployed and need to just like f find a job, right? Like I've bartended between finding the job that was on my career path. It's a thing. I'm not talking about that piece. I'm talking about if you kind of have the luxury to, to look around for a job or you're a senior in college and you're trying to to think about what's next, or you feel underemployed, undervalued um, in your current role, but you have a job, it's, it's a little bit easier to find a job when you already have one. There's, there's uh, some kind of conscious thing that's happening in your brain that makes that possible, but um, do your research. Look for those things like culture, values, um, benefits. Is it important to you? Um, this also can speak back to phrasing. One of the other things that I've seen lately on benefit sites is companies offering maternity leave. Okay, but what happens if you're a male-male couple and you see this place has maternity leave? What happens if your wife is the breadwinner and you're thinking about staying home for a little while? but it says only maternity leave, right? Um, so a simple shift in maternity leave versus family leave, right? 
could attract more talent. So for folks looking, if this is important to you, look for that word family leave, you know, if, if that's important to you. Um, tune up your resume, practice interviewing. I'm going to give you a link at the end to my really horrible website, and the only thing on it is the link to my GitHub repo. Um, but what I've done is build out <clears throat> a workshop that partners, mentors with mentees in the security space for hiring managers to help folks tune up their resumes, right? Get past the keyword filters, um, add the Add relevant experience. Practice interviewing. How many people in the room nailed their first job interview? Just like nailed it. Right. Good job, man. That's great for you. For the rest of us who went home and cried and thought about all the things we should have said, yeah, I, that's, I feel you. Right. Oh. And then how many people like sent the email after, oh, I forgot to tell you, I, I realized the answer to this technical question after we hung up the phone. And then the hiring manager's like, oh, you Googled that shit. Like, I know you did. You went right to Stack Overflow. Um, so practicing, though, it'll help you. Understanding the question. So in that, in that um, framework I've got on my GitHub repo, there's, there's also sample questions now for cultural pieces, technical pieces, whatever you feel like your weakness is in that area. It's never good to try. Um, and I'll plug it again at the end, but the goal of this framework is for you to go out into the world and take the framework to your own conferences, communities, workspaces, and help each other. Um, and then the same thing, take chances, go with your gut. So the go with your gut piece is let's say you're in the very fortunate position that you're offered two jobs at the same time. Has that any, happened to anyone in the room that you get? multiple offers at one time. It happens, right, because we're applying to a lot of places when we're, we finally like said, okay, I'm going to do this. My resume is awesome. You throw a wide net, right? But then, oh shit, now you have to make a decision. How do you make it? So that's this go with your gut piece, and, and that's really all it is. If it's a job and it, and it pays, you know, 20000 more than this other job, is your knee jerk to take it because you need money? But what if this other job really lays out their mentorship programs, their professional development plan, and show a real commitment to your growth in your career rather than just paying you for a job, right? Um, you're going to have everyone in the room will probably have a different spin on that or a different type of answer for that. But it's something to think about, and you just have to kind of, at some point, go with it, right? The choice not made is the one you're given, so don't take too long. All right, so hiring. <clears throat> Come on, give me a break, will you? Anybody? No, no, I just, I'm going to give up on my game. Take a chance on me. ABBA, 1978. I'm looking forward to seeing you all, like, increase the downloads of these particular songs. Um, all right, so hiring challenges. <clears throat> your budget, remember that thing, I can't fix your budget? Hiring costs a lot of money. Think about how much money your folks make and then how much time spent during interviews. That's money that you're paying them that they're not actually doing the job that you hired them to do, right? Interviewing costs money. Recruiting costs money. If you're doing it right, it's going to cost you some cash. Um, and let's say you hire the person. Onboarding costs money, right? Who's seen in a, in a job interview or a, a job description that term hit the ground running? Anyone? Like that term is such bullshit. No one hits the ground running, right? Like unless you're maybe in a, in a different field where like here's your job, move this bottle to this, like you don't hit a security job running. Like it's just not a thing. You s access, who got access the first day at their company? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's probably because you set it up yourself, Rob. All right. So human resources is a challenge. And again, I don't know how this translates here. Um, but in the United States, human resources tend to be like the, one of the biggest blockers for us actually bringing in good people. So there's this, this one piece with the filters, right? Let's solve the problem with AI. We can train the machine to spot the keywords and the good resumes. Okay, so I'll tell you like a quick story about that. 
Um, in my government position with 18F, I was a term employee, which meant that I had a four-year term. It was under an Obama initiative, and you finish your four years, and then you're out. So as I neared the end of my four years as acting director of infrastructure engineering, <clears throat> they found funding to make that position permanent. Great. So they came to me and asked me to write the job description for my own job and to apply for my own job through USA Jobs because, again, the system is so broken and convoluted. And about two or three weeks later, the director asked me, like my director above me, asked why he hadn't seen my resume in the pipeline yet. Was I not interested in the position? <clears throat> okay, so feel me here. I wrote the job description based off my own resume and submitted it, and I didn't get through HR filters for my own job. <laughs> what hope do any of you have, right? So um, in that, in those, uh, my GitHub repo, I have some keyword things that you should add to your resume, and I'm, I'm telling you, you should like research, really read the job description, and if you notice any words that sort of stand out to you in the job description, figure out a way to work them into your resume. Because like the reality is you have to hack the system, which is just weird. Um, and then job descriptions. Like, do you feel my theme with job descriptions yet? Like, so <clears throat> the pipeline, when we're thinking about the pipeline, the pipeline starts with what? Right? Someone needs a job. The job description is kind of the first thing they see. So if you're choking at the job description, like you've, you've bottlenecked your whole pipeline. So let's think about ways to open that up so that we get lots of applicants and we have a different problem, right? You're not gonna know. I don't even know why I bother. Only time will tell if you can break the spell. No one knows Shakespeare's sister. Okay. 1992. Maybe I'm just dating myself. Should I have picked more modern music? Is it a metal thing? Did you want metal? EBM? Trance? Like, what's your deal? Okay, well, I blame Larry for not feeling me in on this. All right. <clears throat> so, why do people leave? Why do people leave? Has anyone ever left a job because the money sucked? I mean, you know, what's the thing? Your work culture, who just couldn't work for that manager one more day or they were gonna just go nuts, right? Who hated their team members? You don't have to raise your hand, especially if your team members are in the room, I encourage you not to raise your hand. Uh, unconscious bias, it's a, it's a thing. Um, and I only have like US numbers for this, but annually, in a, there's a company that did a survey based, it was like Lever's survey or something. Two million, at least in America, two million folks leave their jobs voluntarily every year because they feel like it's either unfair or there's a sense of any of those unconscious bias things that we talked about earlier that were terrible. And that translates to billions of dollars in cost, either with lost revenue or reopening the hiring pipeline each year. So work culture is super important. It's, it's not just a, a frou-frou soft skills thing anymore. Um, we, you know that thing with houses where it's either like a buyer's market or a seller's market and that kind of determines the price, right? If it's a seller's market, the prices on houses are just going to be completely out of control. If it's a buyer's market, the market's flooded with inventory, so the cost of housing goes down. Security professionals, remember that number, three and a half million unfilled cybersecurity positions in 2021? That means that people who know how to do this job kind of get to write their own ticket right now. So <clears throat> they have the luxury and a lot of times a moral duty to focus on companies with a good culture. When I took a job after the federal government in the civilian space with a company that I knew to 
to do work for the federal government, it was extremely important to me to know that they wouldn't work with ICE. So that's a U.S. thing, but I don't know if you've seen, we have a little immigration issue right now with like uh, very unkind tactics being taken to eject immigrants from our country. Um, it was important to me not to work for a company that supported that type of treatment of immigrants. So it meant the world to me to find out in an interview, it was one of the questions I asked. Um, and then I knew that that was a place I could work. But again, I had a couple of different opportunities and I had the luxury. So this won't apply to everyone. If you need a job and you need to feed your family, get the job, feed your family. But then you can do all these things, right? Um, professional development is super important. How many people now in interviews ask what the company's plan for professional development is? Like, do I, maybe you ask it, do I get to go to training? Do you have a training budget? Uh, do I get to attend conferences? Do you support me speaking at conferences? Um, Work-life balance. Who wants to work 90 hours a week? Rob. That's just not true. Maybe you do. I don't know. You saw his keynote yesterday. Did he strike you as somebody that would want to work 90 hours a week? Probably. Um, for the rest of us, uh, in the U.S., we adhere to a 40-hour work week. Um, some companies have 36, but the, the norm is 40. So just as employers expect you to work 40 hours a week to earn your pay, um, employers should also expect you to adhere to the 40-hour work week and not expect you to be nights, weekends, you know, on call 24-7, busting your tail so that they make their numbers, but you're getting paid the same as someone else who maybe does adhere to the 40-hour work week. Do you feel me on this? There's like a sense of fairness there, burnout is real. One of the questions that I like to ask my interviewer, and I encourage folks to ask if you make it to that stage where you think it's coming together for you. Do you know that moment when you feel like, okay, this is lining up, I've had the intro, I've had the technical review, and then you get to the part where either human resources or maybe the director level ask you, you know, do you have any questions for us? A great one is, when's the last time you took a vacation? When's the last time, like, someone on your team took a vacation? If that team lead says, oh, yeah, it's been a couple years, man. We've been, like, so bogged down. Run. Get out. Get out, right? So I asked at, at my current job when I asked one of the, I, the founder did my last interview, you know, when's the last time you took a vacation? And he was like, oh, you know, I was in Japan three months ago. It was amazing. I'm like, that's great. And he's like, yeah, it had been like a year and three months. And then my business partner threatened to turn off my email if I didn't schedule a vacation by the end of the week. So I had to go do that. And I'm like, great. That's good. And I like to hear that. So, um, encouraging work-life balance. All right, professional development, you're not gonna know. Maybe you will. Must have been cold there in my shadow. You guys never saw beaches. It's like the ridiculous, sappy, no, okay. Bette Midler went beneath my wings. You'll think of this song now today, you're welcome. It's a terrible song, by the way. Um, okay, so you get hired, now what? And I should see how I'm doing on time. So, talk about your career when you get to work. Let's start talking about careers, not just the job you're doing. You can talk about the job you're doing, certainly, but start thinking about ways to, to like change that conversation, right? From job talk to career talk. Training, speaking, learning, teaching, all the things. Um, I'll do a quick little plug for SANS. Has anyone attended a SANS training? They're really expensive. Has anyone like had to pay for it themselves? No, right? So you know that shit's expensive. They have a thing called the facilitator program though and you can attend the SANS training and do the training and get an exam attempt for the certification for a fifth of the price. So I just throw that out there for those of you who are looking or looking to grow yourselves but have to do it on your own budget. Look for inexpensive or even free training opportunities out in the community. They're out there, you just have to look. But if you, if you think a cert will help you um, with the job that you wanna get because it like lists what certs they wanna see um, and you just don't have the cash to do it, think about 
the facilitator program. That's all. I've done it a few times because the feds had a $3,000 annual budget for training, and one SANS training can be about 7000 in the U.S. So, uh, okay. Mentorship, please. Really? Uh, see, you're dancing. See, you feel me. There you go. You probably don't know who did it, though, do you? So close. We'll give you like a applause for dancing, though. Um, Rob Bass and DJ, DJ Easy Rock. All right, so what doesn't work? You enjoy my bat pictures yet? Is anybody loving bats as much as I am right now? Or no, you just thought they were ugly, right? They're super cute. They have so much personality. They're like sky puppies. All right, so for mentorship, what's not going to work? Um, <clears throat> all these things don't work in a mentor-mentee relationship. So if you don't talk about what the goal of being mentored is, how do you expect to get anything out of it? Right? Like you have to have some conversations about this. If you're not committed to the process, and this is for mentors and mentees in the room, if you're not committed, it's not going to work. Um, yeah, broken promises. Like how many people in the room were assigned a mentor and it just all fell apart because life happens and you get busy with work? I mean, or those of us who have tried to mentor people and we desperately want to provide that support for them, but we're out of runway, right? We just, no more spoons, as the saying goes. Um, quitting after failure. Well, this mentor mentee thing didn't work, so we're going to dis, you know, we're going to disengage from this program. We're going to shut it down, whatever. Like, boo, that doesn't help anyone. Just because, like, one pairing didn't work doesn't mean they won't, like, another one wouldn't work really well. And gatekeeping, I just, can I assume that everyone knows what I mean when I say gatekeeping? Like, don't, don't try to be that person who decides who does and doesn't belong. Like, just think of it, oh, they're not a hacker because they haven't written an exploit. Oh, you know what, though? They, like, defended against these four things, and they have a CVE. Like, so don't, don't do that. Like, kind of step outside that, that box and just let's assume that everyone belongs and, and break out of that place where there's this, like, elite mentality that only us and, and then there's them, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, but what works in a mentoring relationship? Do the opposite of all those other things I just talked about, right? Um, and then the capturing failures piece, if a pairing doesn't work, if your mentor program at your organization doesn't work, whether you're a mentor or a mentee, capture that and bring it to somebody who cares about the mentor program so that you can make change in a positive way to improve the program. All right, so the us versus them, all it does is promote fear and consternation. Anyone? Oh, you know this one. Bad religion, that's right. Okay, you should download this album if you haven't already. All right, so, <laughs> look at bats are cute. Come on, God, this is a hard crowd. So it's not a us versus them, we're a we now. If we're gonna move forward, we have to be a we. There's enough pie for everyone. Do you know what I say, what I mean when I say this? So if you think about the piece of pie and you cut it and, you know, there are eight people in the room and they all get a slice, if that guy takes two, then, you know, somebody's not getting pie. Or what if two more people come in, well, we're out of pie. No, no, there's just enough pie. So jobs, opportunities for everyone. Remember that number, three and a half million unfilled positions in the next year. Stop thinking about other people's successes as your failures. Like, other people can be successful too. You can be successful. We can all be successful. If a person at your work achieves a level of success, it doesn't mean that there's not a place for you to like find your way or let your light shine, right? So be happy for your colleagues. And I know that that's not always easy, right? But it's, it's a, you're going to live a happier life if you can find a way to, one, stop taking everything so personally, and two, like, enjoy the success of others, and then that'll come back to you. It, it's not like hippy-dippy stuff. Like, it's a real thing. Silos are garbage. How do you think I feel about silos? I was pretty clear on this one. So what do I mean by that, though? How many security people in the room 
are stupid frustrated with their IT team. Liars. Everyone without their hand raised, liars. Um, how many security folks are frustrated with engineers? Um, so how many security folks find that infrastructure is their blocker? Right, except I'm infrastructure, but yeah, I'm my own blocker a lot of times. So when I talk about tearing down silos, I, I think, and this is just a little bit of a takeaway, if you can get away from that idea again of this us versus them and realize that you all have the same goal, right, to build a secure thing. It's just that some people's task is securing the user. Some folks' tasks are securing the infrastructure. Some folks have to focus on writing secure code or rewriting code once the security team tells them that their code's not secure. Those conversations are hard to have. Um, but if you can think of all of that as a we instead of like a security versus everyone else, you could build a better thing you don't, I mean, just try it once and you'll see maybe if you plant a security person in your first sprint with the engineers, you'll find that you get a very different outcome than if you try to deal with the security piece once the sprint's over and the thing's built and you're, you're ready to go to testing, right? Um, you can save yourself some time. We call that baked in security. Who knows the word, the term? Well, now you do baked in security. So it's like the idea that from the beginning, you're working together to just build the best thing and stop fighting. Oh my God. I consider it a challenge before the whole human race. Secure all the things. I swear. Please, yes. Queen, yay, we got it. Your prize is that you're now my favorite, okay. Um, 1977. All right. So I'm going to throw some final thoughts at you. Security is a journey, not a destination. Um, Bob, I think, touched on this a little bit yesterday, like with his security as a feeling. But raise your hand if the thing that you work on is 100% secure and unhackable. But raise your hand if you feel pretty good about it. Okay. I mean, this you know, that's the best we can do, right? Uh, don't hoard knowledge, that's weird. Folks, that's just weird. Hey, can you show me how you like pivoted to this server from you know, that exploit? No. What? Okay, that person's never gonna ask you another question. How about, yeah, let me write this report that's gonna take 12 times longer than it took me to pop the box, and then we can sit down and I'll show you what I did, right? Like just try to share knowledge um, yeah so it's it's like my little mantra but we are all in this together if we're gonna do this and we're gonna do it right we have to start thinking as a as a team as a collective as an us as a we or we're gonna fail um, take a vacation who's taking a vacation within the last six months look at that see Europe very different in the United States. You probably get like mandatory vacations here, don't you? Oh, I would flip you off, but it's a keynote and I probably shouldn't do that. Um, be kind, right? Like if you take nothing else away from this today, just be kind. Like, what does it hurt? It, it, you know, when you carry around this like animosity and like hiring's broken, we can't fix the pipeline, not enough women are applying, we need to check a diversity box, we need to f fix all these things and you keep thinking of it in this like very stressful way, you're kind of un unable to be kind. You're not able to really like be your best self. But if we can think about things like, hey, how can I be more thoughtful with my job descriptions? How can I sell my brand in a way that lets folks know I care about values and culture? If I can encourage folks in interviews by, by letting them know we're going to have some professional development opportunities. A lot of those other problems we're trying to solve with like diversity, inclusion, um, 
and bringing folks from marginalized communities into the tech world, those problems kind of work themselves out because we've addressed some of the things that are choking the pipeline very early on in the process. <clears throat> so we're almost out of time. I could take like two questions maybe until they yell at me or drag me off with an umbrella. Yes, no. Anyone have any questions? It's because you, you're smarter than people in the US. Is that what you're saying? No, I get you. Fine. Then here's what you get. Oops, sorry. We're out of time. So uh, this is all the bat docs. This is all about me. Um, my Twitter handle is Ms. Bat, not safe for work. Uh, Kimber at trust.works if you want to shoot me an email or, you know, if you're interested <laughs> in having a secure infrastructure. Um, on AWS, call me up. Um, but this mock interview and resume workshop uh, repo lives at stabops.com. Um, and that's where you'll find the repo if you want to contribute, if you have a community project that you're working on that partners mentors and mentees, feel free to contribute to the repo. Like, let's build it up. It's a community effort. I just happen to own it or maintain it. but. Everyone's welcome to take it back to their communities. Um, if you heard, PyCon has used the framework at their conference. A lot of B-sides in the United States have used them. And I've gone to a few conferences and run, run the workshop myself. And then uh, also Hacker Cookbook. I put this in here because I assume that your food is far superior to the food that's been contributed from the United States. This is food. These aren't exploits. That's a different hacker cookbook. This is actual food with like beer and wine pairings. Feel free to contribute a recipe to the repo. Um, we, uh, Franklin down here and I and, and another person, Dan, work on PCB projects. So those things that you see, like you're wearing one today, we build those too and we've got some projects up on the deadlock repo. Please don't forget to grab a mentor mentee sticker. It's a really good way to just open a dialogue with other people in the room. And uh, I really just want to thank you all for having me today. Thank you.